All right, so we're back talking about seeking God, back in prayer. And um, last week we talked about the purpose of prayer. Talked about that the purpose of prayer is to equip us spiritually for whatever life throws at us. That that's one of the purposes and that mm -hmm. the word of God is a seed that takes time to grow. So praying when you get in trouble is kind of like planting an apple seed when bit. you get hungry. Yeah. And that uh, Jesus is the only mediator between us and God. So we looked at the Old Testament, how mm -hmm. Abraham, you know, mediated between God to stop his anger. Moses mediated between God not to destroy the Israelites. Mm -hmm. But now Jesus is the only mediator we needed. But then in addition to that, that God no longer does things out of anger, judgment, and punishment. Because Jesus' death now satisfied that. So God no longer acts out of judgment, anger, and punishment mm -hmm. to us. Um, and then we talked about the fact that the main purpose of prayer is to develop a relationship with mm -hmm. God. And that God loves us unconditionally and deserves for us to seek an intimate relationship with him for the yep. access that we have. So that was last week. So this week we're going to look mm -hmm. at why our prayers may not be working. Mm -hmm. So last week we looked at the fact that the main reason of prayer is to develop a relationship. So this week we're going to talk about the other prayers when we're asking for stuff and why those may not be working. Sorry, I, I just... Because, you know, when we have relationships with people, everything we ask for, we get, right? Yes, yeah. all the time. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, <clears throat> never mind. That's how they work. Anyway. A healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So we look at reasons why prayers don't get answers. And, you know, so other than the kind of normal churchy responses that it's not God's will, uh, mm. it's because it was a selfish prayer or because we've not following his laws. And so we've talked about those previously mm -hmm. in the other lessons. So now we're gonna look at other reasons. Yeah. So we've, we've, we've addressed those. Mm -hmm. Did you ever notice that there's no instruction in the Bible for unanswered prayer? How to deal with unanswered prayer? I haven't thought about it, but now that you say that, yeah, I can't think of one. Yeah, so that's interesting. Because mm -hmm. it was designed that we would get answers and so yeah so we won't be talking about today we won't look at how to beg better <laughs> but we'll look at uh, address some of the fundamental reasons why our prayers don't get answers because mm -hmm. when we get answered to prayer it makes us happy yeah. and it increases our faith so if we ask for something God gives it to us then we have more faith that God will give it to us that he is there that he listens mm -hmm. um, if we don't get answers then we have to get our happiness out of the discipline of prayer. Mm. Prayer is a discipline, yeah. or, or we celebrate the form of prayer instead of the breakthroughs. Yeah. You know, it becomes a religious thing, and we just just the action, mm. and we concern ourselves with how we're praying more. So, and there's no virtue in prayer itself. So it's not a matter of building up holy points. <laughs> But, it's, but we yeah. did talk about it. it is important to build a relationship with yeah. God. Yeah. So the first, we'll look at some of the normal responses and address those. Um, so God does care about what we want. So the first thought is, is it okay for us to ask God for what we want? I don't yeah. see why it wouldn't be, but... Right. So Jesus instructs us not to worry about tomorrow. Yeah. But he doesn't say don't ask. Yeah. So you have John 16. I do. 22. 24. All right. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth. My father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. All right, so basically, Jesus is saying that after he dies and raises, that they can ask for anything mm -hmm. in his name. And so we saw that they asked for 
you know, to heal people, heal blind people, yep. raise their, cast out demons they asked yep. for in his name, and they got the stuff that they asked for. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a father, God is our father, he does delight in giving us what we want. He, he wants to give us the things mm -hmm. he wants, so any father, you know, if you get some kid something for Christmas, yeah. it's not just giving it to them, you want to watch them open it, right. and it brings you satisfaction. <laughs> So God is our Father. He also wants to give us the desires of our hearts. Mm -hmm. And he does want to give us things. But, you know, like other parents, he's not going to necessarily just give us everything we ask for. Right. So. It's like, yeah, when it's healthy. When it's healthy. <laughs> and then there's another thought of people say, oh, it's not God's will. So is it true that whatever happens is what God wanted to happen? That's that's a fun one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a lot of people blame God for everything that happens. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're not asking if God knew what was going to happen or or could, could change it, but we're saying is, is that what God wanted to happen? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Is it God's will? So I would argue no. So if we look at things not being God's will, so we know that God was not willing that any one person would perish. Mm -hmm. So God, the Bible says God wants everyone to be saved. Yep. But we know that everyone's not going to be saved. So we know his will is that everyone be saved. Yeah. And we know that that's well, not going to happen. It's, it's fundamental. You, like you can't, you have more than one will. Like you're going to have some sort of, disagreement between the two eventually and then the, then you've got a problem like oh you mean uh the like if, you, if you've got god's will and then our free will oh right right like right. totally free will it's like eventually if we decide we don't want to do what he wants now now what happens right exactly that's, and that's where the the, the problem comes in here. yeah yeah so if you yeah. think that god's everything that happened is god will hmm then you would have to think that, okay, what Hitler did was God's mm. will. Every instance of rape is God's will. Every abortion is God's will. Every murder is God's will. Every homosexual activity is God's will. Slavery was God's will. And then if we believe all of that, then why would we pray against those things mm. if we think that's God's will? So why would we pray against God's will? And then you say, well, why did Jesus pray? If everything was going to just happen, mm -hmm. it would be God's will. So. Why, why is that the second or third or whatever thing in the Lord's Prayer? Yeah. Thy will be done. Yeah. Like, what's the point of that if everything that happens is his will? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what we're at. Yeah, so, mm. yeah, thy will be done um, is in the Lord's Prayer, and that's saying that, that, uh, you know, and what's the purpose of praying? Yeah, as on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. And it, so it assumes that we can influence that through mm -hmm. our prayers when we say that. And it assumes that God will fulfill the things that we ask for. If he's telling us to ask for it, there yeah. must be a reason. And uh, so if he's telling us to ask for it, it must mean that there's some resources to fulfill it. Mm. So, and uh, if we believe that everything that happens is God will, it's kind of contradictory because it's like, why do we need to pray? And then, you know, why would God do something and then empower us to pray against it. Mm -hmm. So it's like on one hand, we, be, you know, we believe it's God's will that this relative dies. We say, oh, it's God's timing. But on the other hand, we pray mm -hmm. that they don't die. So it's kind of a contradictory view it. of it. You know, if God approves of everything, then why did he give us yeah, the ability to was, change it? Right. So, yeah, like I said, thy will be done. Say, why? Why do we need to pray instead of him just doing it himself? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if it's gonna if it's just gonna do what he wants to do, then mm -hmm. so God has given us 
his word, they were like you mentioned, that we have free will. Mm -hmm. So he's told us that we have free will. So he can't go back on that. Right. So we have free will. And prayer is a process to bring God's will on earth. So our prayers, we're submitting God's will back align, to him. Yeah, align right. our word. We're, yeah. we're saying, hey, I'm, I'm uh, giving up my right to free will mm -hmm. and asking for your will to be done. So that's the... Yep. Um, so the will of God is what he hopes for is his dream, but the intention of thy will be done on earth is to bridge the gap between mm -hmm. the distance of the two. Um, so not everything that happens is God will. So God is all powerful. God is in charge of everything, but he's not in control of everything. So there's some things that he's given control over to us. Mm -hmm. There's some things that Adam gave control over to Satan. Yeah. And there's some things that we give control over to Satan. So an example yeah. of that is we had a, uh, a company-wide meeting. You know, mm -hmm. the CEO, like after the quarterly uh -huh. announcement, and the CEO was talking about, you know, the product, the future product lines and mm -hmm. the company. And, and so... He had a period of question and answers. And so, you know, he's the CEO, so people were asking, you know, about well, do we want to go in the cloud technology? Mm -hmm. Should we hit this, you know, look at this? So he's answering that. And then other people were asking about, well, the way we accounting type stuff, well, the way we recognize our revenue wouldn't be better. And so he's speaking mm -hmm. to that. And so he's, and then somebody asked, well, and you know, so, you know, I'm at a company, there's like 3,000 people in okay. our one campus. Yep with, uh, you know, six, three buildings with 16 floors, break rooms on every floor, so, like mm -hmm. sodas and stuff. so somebody asked, why don't we have Dr. Pepper in the break rooms? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. it's so easy as a... Uh, Valid question, I suppose. So he says, uh, we don't have Dr. Pepper in the break room. <laughs> so so he, he says, uh, you might want to... You know, talk to facilities yeah, or somebody, somebody who actually so, knows. So he's responsible for yeah. everything that happens in the company, but he's giving control of that area to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, and actually, that's outsourced to a third party. Oh, yeah, so they okay. so they choose. You know, he mm -hmm. doesn't choose. You know, they bring whatever sodas they they have. And so <laughs> it's like God. He's giving control over to us. So you know, if something. So if something is, you know, if, if we're in charge of it, then we don't need to go back to God for it. Mm -hmm. So another thing people talk about is uh, their heart's desire. They say, why would God put this in my heart mm -hmm. if he didn't want me to have it? And so a lot of times I use that for a spouse. And so their, their natural desires, desires that uh, God puts into everyone, mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily something unique that he gives to you. So it's like everyone, you know, people have desires to be in a relationship. People have sexual desires. Mm -hmm. People have. It's not that God specifically gave you that oh, desire right. for a particular purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I have a friend who wants to be filthy rich, drive a Ferrari <laughs> in a Namarni suit with three supermodels in the back seat. Mm -hmm. And that's a real desire of his heart. But I'm thinking God did put that in his heart as his desire. Uh, that's my guess. Seems unlikely to me. Yeah. I don't know for sure. but So it's just because you have a desire, you know, it could be from the culture, mm -hmm. TV, magazines, from the world, influence of the world, family, friends. Could influence your desires, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like God gave me a craving for chocolate, so he must want me to eat chocolate all the time. So just because you want something doesn't mean it's good for you. And just because you want something, you have a desire in your heart, doesn't mean that it's God's will for you. Mm -hmm. And so in Matthew 15, 19, it says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. So it says those come out of the heart. So just because you desire something in your heart doesn't mean it's God's will. Because you could want murder, you could want adultery, you could want to steal. Those are all desires in your heart. Mm -hmm. 
and those are all evil. So there are desires in your heart that don't come from God. All right. So now we will get to 10 reasons why our prayers aren't answered. Okay. All right. So number one is real deep. Mm. The answer is wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So God has determined that it'll be better for you to have it later. Mm -hmm. It's not the time right now. So that's number one. The answer is wait. Number two, similar, is when the answer is no. So that is an answer. People forget that no is an answer. <laughs> And it is an answer prayer. You say, mm -hmm. God, I can have this. And God says, no, that's an answer. Mm -hmm. So that is an answer prayer. You got to answer to your prayer. And your answer was no. So it's like if a seven-year-old asks his dad, hey, can I drive? You know, he's going to say no. You know? <laughs> and if he asks him enough, you know, he may ignore him at some point. But he's answering him. You get an answer, no. You don't always get what you want. That's not what... Mm -hmm. God is. That's not what being a father, having a father is about. So number three is that you may have moved outside of God's will and you've moved so far out that he's removed his protection from you. Mm -hmm. So he's not protecting you from the consequences of where you are. So in life we always have a choice. We're always going to have a choice between wrong and right. Mm -hmm. So no matter where we are, no matter how righteous we are, no matter where we are in life, we're always going to get presented a choice between wrong and right. That's the way life is designed. Mm -hmm. And it's up for us to choose right. So if you choose wrong and you keep choosing wrong, then you may get to a point where God removes his protection and he lets things happen to you. So it's not God doing it as punishment, mm -hmm. but it's just he removes his hands of protection and lets what will be be. And so you can choose a path different from the one God wants you to take. And uh, so then God may hand control over to you and say, you know, if you want, you know, so God is handing control over you. You're outside of his protection now. So it's like a child when they move out of the house. Mm -hmm. You know, the parents are no longer, and you decide, hey, I want to eat um, beef jerky every day. You know, the parent, they could call you every day and say, hey, are you still eating your vegetables? Hey, mm -hmm. or, still, or go over there and make you do it. But <laughs> they're letting you, hey, you're, you're, yeah. they're letting you take control of it. And so you have choices and you have consequences for those choices. So that's number three. Number four, so we talked about that God gives us free will. But number four reason that God may not answer your prayer is that if you're asking God to violate somebody else's free will. Mm -hmm. So like say you have a coworker that hates you and you say, mm -hmm. God, make them like me. They have free will to hate you. Mm -hmm. So you can't ask God to, to make change their free will. So you can't ask God, hey, make this person want to marry me. <laughs> you know, they have free will. You, you can't ask God to take that from them. You know, everybody has free will. So if you're asking God to violate someone else's free will, he's not going to do it. I guess oh, that's why um, I heard many pastors say, they say, we got to ask God to change our heart, right. not theirs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. not, not the person, but ours. Right. So I guess we can see them like Jesus will see them, right? Mm. With compassion, yeah, and and you know understand why they act the way they act because they don't have Jesus in their heart. Right, or they may have Jesus in their heart. Oh, they may it's, have, yeah. It's still, yeah. yeah. So another situation like that is if uh, if we're like sometimes if you're in if someone is harming you and you ask God to make them stop. You're violating mm. their will. So it sounds like semantics, but what you should do is ask God to help you. Mm -hmm. So you should, if you ask God to help you, that's different from asking God to make them stop. 
Mm. Never thought about that And it seems, you know, and it kind of doesn't seem right or fair maybe, but it, it is, it does matter. I mean, if you look at like, you know, I heard someone talking about children that were in abusive situations or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and that when they followed up on when they looked at the ones that, what did you ask and what happened and, and just, so I mean, you ask God to help you, but don't ask mm -hmm. God to violate someone else's will. Hmm. So that's a thing to think about if you aren't getting your prayers answered. So number five is it could lead you away from your purpose in life. So God has a plan for you and you're asking him for something that leads you away from that plan. And you've given, you know, you've been in agreement with God as if you want to do his will or your plan for his life, but you're asking for something against it. So he may not give that to you. So you may be asking for to find, you know, for this guy and who's never left Stockton to marry you, but God has a plan for you to be a missionary in Paris. Mm -hmm. You know, if you marry the guy in Stockton, you guys will never, you, you'll be in Stockton for the rest of your life and you won't get to do your missionary work in Paris. That was planned for your life. So it, it conflicts with God's purpose for your life is number five. So number six is that it, it'll be harmful for you. Mm -hmm. So maybe you aren't ready yet. So uh, uh, Maria was talking about the fact because she teaches children one and under. Mm -hmm. and she was saying that sometimes the parents will bring the kid and they'll sit the kid up and then they'll leave, you know, leave him there to, for them today. And she said that's, the, the re that's harmful because some of those kids can't sit up yet by themselves so they're still crawling and so if you that child won't know how to get up from that sitting up position it'll hurt itself trying to get down because it doesn't so like eventually they'll learn to roll over and they'll learn to push themselves and they'll learn to sit up but if they haven't learned that yet and you put them in that position then you're going to put them in a position to hurt themselves mm -hmm. so she's saying you should never put a child in a position that he can't get to himself mm -hmm. So it's the same thing that we may be asking God to put us in a position that will hurt us, that'll be harmful for us. And so we're not ready for that yet. So we need to build up before we can get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, so for seven through 10, I have more detailed discussions of them, but I'll mm -hmm. list them out first and then go through the detail. So number seven, is that, so we talked about, it's a trial that's meant to build you. Mm -hmm. So it's not something put on as a response to, as judgment on you, something you did wrong, but it's, a, it's something that is there, it's a season that's supposed to build your character or prepare you for something in the future. Mm -hmm. So it's not a God judging you or a response to God is angry at you. It's a trial that is meant to strengthen you. Uh, number eight, is that you gave control over to the enemy. So mm -hmm. like Adam gave control over to Satan, so you took control from God or from yourself and gave it to the enemy. Mm -hmm. and we'll go into detail on that one as well. Number nine is that God already answered you. He may have already gave you the answer to what you asked for, and now you gotta go and find it or remember it Mm -hmm. And number 10 is that God put you in control of that area. Okay. So now we'll talk about trials. So, so trial is, you know, if, if you're in a situation you think is bad and it, it's a trial and it's to build you up. So we talked about last week that God no longer acts out of judgment or anger. So it's not punishment because Jesus, Jesus, um, Jesus' blood was sufficient 
for that, but it's for our benefit. And so we'll go to unlikely passage to look at that. You have Genesis. I do. One, one and two. One and two. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay. So, when God started creation, did he start it by creating something beautiful and spectacular? Mm. Not so much. No, he created something that was without form, it was void, and it was dark. And so, and some say it was chaotic. Mm -hmm. So God created chaos first. So, in the same way, sometimes God, so so God can develop good things out of chaos. And so God produced life out of this chaos. So God deliberately created the chaos and the darkness as the womb from which the earth was birthed. So the earth was birthed out of chaos. And then, you know, later in the verse we see that and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. So the Spirit of God hovered over the water and we know from John 1, you know, that all things were made by Him, Jesus. So I mean, you say that it was Jesus' spirit that was hovering over the water. And so when you, and so hovering over the water, he transformed the darkness into life. So he started with darkness, but out of that, he spoke to it to create light. Mm -hmm. He spoke to create the, anim the animals in the sea. The earth came out of the the waters, life came out of the waters, and so everything that exists here came out of that chaos. And so if we look at God's method of how he does things, you know, sometimes there are, he can produce, there can be chaos that's formed and it's the purpose is for somebody to rise up or for you to rise up specifically, or maybe a chaos broader chaos for his people to rise up, to take, to, it's to develop you, to strengthen you in some area. And so, it, the, and that may be the only method you're going to develop that strength. And so if we're in the chaos, you know, we look at what did God do? He spoke to create light. So we want to speak light into the situation. So if we're in a situ a chaotic situation, we don't want to talk negatively and, and mm -hmm. complain about it. We want to speak life into it, speak, speak life into the spirit world to cause it good. You know, speak, you know, I know God is using this for good. I know that, you know, that plans speak life into it. And when you, when the spirit was hovering over the water, when you hover over the water, you see your own reflection. And he saw that it was good. And so that's what came out of it. You know, so we need to look for the good in those situations. So we can look at chaos as a principle of productivity, not a principle for destruction. So an example of that is a, a caterpillar. Mm -hmm. So caterpillars, eventually they build cocoons and they wrap themselves in it and they become butterflies. And so there was someone who saw a bunch of cocoons and they decided, hey, I need to help. And they, they were starting to try to hatch, try to mm -hmm. break out. And so he said, let me help them. And so he took a knife and he cut the <coughs> butterflies out. So the butterflies came out, but then he realized that, hey, now none of these butterflies were flying. Mm -hmm. And so he said, oh, I guess the butterflies in this region were defective or something. They can't fly. But what actually happens is, is that the cocoon, when the caterpillar is wrapped in the cocoon, it's the pushing and breaking 
out, it strengthens their wings mm -hmm. that allows them to fly. So it's like the, the, them breaking out, them struggling and, and pushing and struggling to get to free themselves, to get out of that situation is what turns them into what they need to be. You know, they, if, they, if, if they don't go through that, then they won't be able to fly. They won't reach their full potential. Mm -hmm. So it's the breaking out it's the overcoming that circumstance that that creates that creates us sometimes, and so it's our faith is built. You know, if everything in your life goes good, you say, "Oh, I believe in God," or whatever. but then when something happens, all of a sudden, you, you, all your faith is gone. Mm -hmm. But it's like if we've been through something and God brought us through, and we went through something bigger and God brought mm -hmm. us through. Every time we go through something, you know, we get our faith. You know, then but then maybe months or years later, you know, you lose your job. You say, oh, God's going to get me through. God get, gets you through. And you're like, okay, now. So now you have a little more faith. So you're not, so you, you go through these situations and your faith rises every time you get out of a struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, it, over time it's going to go back down, but it's never going to go back down to where it was before you got into that struggle. Mm -hmm. so the next time you lose your job, you're not as concerned if you're in the same situation. And so it's, it's the circumstances, it's the trials that build us up sometimes. And so the only reason that God comes in to, to get us out of those chaos sometimes is if we're not doing our job, if we're not, mm -hmm. if we're not doing what we're supposed to do to get out. So if you realize that every time there's chaos, that there's something valuable hidden in it, then even if it was something that was, wasn't caused by God, there's still something valuable hidden, can be something valuable hidden in it. So if every time you're in a bad situation, you turn it for good, or you, God turns it for good, or you, you have faith to turn it for good, then Satan will, will start to realize, okay, well, this is just helping this person, and they'll start to leave you alone. Because mm -hmm. then you've taken away one of his weapons. So that leads us to the next one. So the next one is you gave control to the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so this one is interesting. I was going to take it out, but it's, uh, so this one really needs uh, a lot of setup <laughs> and a lot of explanation, mm -hmm. but I don't have time for that. So it's uh, so it's going to be kind of a high level uh, discussion of it, and and it's not going to go into details about the mm -hmm. solution. But so with that stated, so you gave control over the enemy. So it's a little yeah. So anyway, so there's three types of access that we give to the enemy. So there's access to our body, our soul, and our spirit. Or three methods of access that we give control to mm -hmm. the enemy. Okay. So example of the body is sex outside of marriage, abortion. Then we give the enemy access to us. And things like diseases and, and that nature and sickness are types of things are results. So it's, that's an access of body. Another area of access is the soul. We give the enemy access. So an example of that is occult activity. And so not just, hey, I'm worshiping Satan, but even like horoscopes, fortune tellers, secret societies, that gives the enemy Access, so access in the sense that now you've given him permission to interfere with you. You've given the enemy permission to enter into your life. So it's, it, it, he needs permission to interfere with you. You know, he asked Job, he asked God, you know, he had to go talk to God mm -hmm. to, to mess with Job. And so we're, 
we can also give them access, so we're giving them access ourselves through these areas. Another soul access is uh, generational curses, so it's not actually us giving it to them ourselves, but there are generational curses that get passed down, and uncontrolled anger, fears, addiction, behaviors, and those can get passed down, and it's not, I guess it's not actually you given that access, but that gives the enemy access as way of access. So most of those two are, you know, the body is so it's, it's you. I mean, you know if you've been involved with code activity, you know mm -hmm. you had sex or you know you had an abortion. Um, but then the spirit is a area we may not necessarily know. So that's the area I get a little bit deeper into. So that's things like unforgiveness, which we talked about unforgiveness, but we didn't talk about it in this manner. Um, rejection, fears. So um, unforgiveness related and uh, judgment. Mm -hmm. So we talked about judgment, but we're going to look at it here a little differently. So judgment, there's discernment. There's two types of judgment. There's discernment and there's judgment. <laughs> so discernment is when you say this is right or wrong mm -hmm. so if somebody does something you say hey that's wrong something happens wrong so there's nothing wrong with that you know so there, that's there's no problem with that you know God says don't judge that's not what he's talking about you mm -hmm. say hey that's wrong you shouldn't do it judgment is when you think badly about the person because they did wrong, mm -hmm. or you feel angry towards the person because they did wrong, or you have negative feelings towards the person because they went wrong, did wrong. And so, when you have judgment, it causes unforgiveness. So if you're judging that someone did something to you is wrong and you anger towards them, then that causes the unforgiveness and that gives the enemy access the unforgiveness and the judgment. And so the enemy wants us, you know, to accuse God, to blame ourselves, or to make a judgment on someone else. Um, another area is fear. So fear is a natural response, you know, to be mm -hmm. afraid, and it's there to protect us. But if we embrace a fear or let a fear define us, you know, I am afraid of heights. I am afraid of, if we let a, f a fear define us, then we're coming to an agreement with the spirit of fear and we're giving it access to stay if we come into agreement. So a lot, so a lot of times, so if God or situations happen or a lie will be presented to us, and if we come into agreement with it, then we're giving it that right mm -hmm. to stay. And then the third area are inner vows you make. So if you make inner vows, you're basically putting yourself in charge instead of God. So if you say, I'm ugly, mm -hmm. if you say, I'm stupid, if you say, nobody likes me, you say, I can't trust anyone. You say, all men are dogs. If you say, I'm powerless. If you say, I'm helpless. Now you're taking the control out of God's hand and you're saying, okay, it's all on me or it's all on these other people who are doing it. And so that gives the enemy access. If you make this mm -hmm. inner vow, you know, maybe something happens to you as a child. And so, um, you know, psychologists also talk about how, so like maybe you feel rejected as a child, you know, the parents, you, you feel, you get abandonment. So now you feel abandoned, you get abandonment. And that, and, or maybe they say that a child that heard a story of a study they did where they had mother smoke and the baby like curled up to get away from the smoke, like they, they changed their position in the, mm -hmm. in the stomach. And then they, they had the mother think about smoking. And the baby did the same thing. Mm. 
So it, it wasn't, so they, they knew the thoughts. And so the baby can feel the thoughts. And so in the same way if a rejection, so baby can feel rejected even from in the womb. So like if, if you, if a, if a baby knows that the parents didn't want them, they can feel it and they can feel a sense of rejection. If a baby feels the sense that, okay, the parents wanted a boy, but it's a girl, or the parents wanted a girl and it's a boy, then the baby can feel that rejection from it, from the womb. And then maybe, I don't know, you know, maybe if, if you feel rejected, for, if you feel bad for being a boy when you come out, you know, maybe you have a tendency to want to be a girl. But, but, the, but the feeling of rejection, though, gives the enemy access to come in and influence you and stay in that area. And so, um, if it becomes part of our core belief system, then we believe the lies, and, and uh, then our reality is based on a lie and not the truth. You know, I'm worthless, I'm powerless, I'm helpless, and, and now we're in bondage. So bondage is when you come agreement with the enemy. And so freedom can be had through Jesus. So if there's some type of repeating patterns or repeating habits, that are in your life, then it's potential that there was somewhere where the enemy was let in and you've come into agreement mm -hmm. with it. And it, so it's not necessarily, even a traumatic, traumatic situation, it's not what happened to you, it's how you responded to it. So, and it's not even necessarily something you did willingly. So maybe something that happened to you, but then your response is, is also and so I, the, unfortunately mm. I don't have. Um, I may do another study to talk about the solutions to it, mm -hmm. but that that gets a little deeper than our study. But there, but the types of solutions are there's counseling. There is uh, something called inner healing, which is a Christian type of counseling. So it's inner healing that there are places and churches that do. Um, and, and online, even inner healing that you do process that you go through, maybe journaling your past hurts and various things. And then there's deliverance, where people try to directly get the evil spirits to stop influencing you. So, so that's that area. The enemy. So that's when you've allowed, you've given the enemy access, control. And so the last one is, that's not the last one, the next one <laughs> is we already have the answer. Mm -hmm. So sometimes God won't talk to us because he already told us the answer. So we read it in the Bible or he told us directly and you know when you get desperate enough you'll go back and look for it. So you might be praying for something you already have. So you're praying for God to do something that he's done, then you're going to get frustrated. Mm. So, and, or if you're praying for God to do something in an area that he gave us control over. So he gave you the power to do it, and you're praying for him to do it. Um, let's see. So God has given us authority. What verse did I give you? 10 1. Okay, Matthew 10 1. Let me read that one. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. So Jesus' resurrection gave the disciples the power to cast out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus. And so they got that authority because they believed in Jesus was the Son of God and that he rose for their sins. So that authority is also given to us mm -hmm. if we have a faith in it. Mm -hmm. So he's given us the authority 
to have our sins forgiven. You know, we don't have to pray and say, God, please send your son Jesus to forgive me of my sins. He already did it. But it's the same way with the healing mm -hmm. and the deliverance. He already did it. But it's the same way, but with the salvation, it's only if you have faith and you believe that he did it. And so this is, uh, we're going to get into this deeper next time. So we're going to talk about deeper into that. But if, but if you knew you already had something, you wouldn't doubt it. So if you were convinced that you had the ability to do it, then you wouldn't quit. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't quit until you saw it manifested. If you really believed you had it, then even though if you didn't see it working, you would keep trying if you really believed you had it. So in those situations, salvation, so faith isn't about getting God to do something. So I have faith mm -hmm. in salvation. So Jesus died on the cross for me. So it's not about, my faith isn't about getting God to do something. The faith is about me responding to something God already did. And then the last area is that God put us in control. So God may not be answering because he, so, in, so similar to that, so with the healing, so if so God, one answer your prayer if you're praying for something that he's delegated for you to can take control over. So the disciples, he gave them, he gave them uh, power over all disease and sickness. So he gave us, um, so if it's an area that God gave us control over, mm -hmm. then it's kind of like, you know, you go to work, you get a new job, and your boss gives you your assignment, gives you a stack of papers at the beginning of the day, and he comes back in the middle of the day and you go, he go, how are things going? You say, oh, they're going great. Yeah, uh, can you take care of this stack of papers? And he's like, I gave that to you to do. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same when we go back to God and ask him for stuff that he gave to us to do. Mm -hmm. So there's some stuff he gave to us to do and we're, we're taking it back and say, hey God, can you do this? And he's like, that's your job. <laughs> There is that song, uh, I can't remember who sings it, but he's going with his fist to heaven and telling God, why don't you do something, the song says. And then he says, he kept singing, and at the end he says, uh, that, he, that God says, I created you, mm. you know, like for the poor and for all Oh, that. why don't you help the yes. poor, why don't uh -huh. you, exactly, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah, so he's good. He's, I forgot his name. Maybe it's Matt Redman. Uh, yeah, it's like those people I hear, they're like, oh, I can't believe, you know, Bill Gates isn't contributing more to the poor. He isn't helping out charities. You know, or they'll have like one specific, you know, Bill Gates isn't helping the uh, the one-leg orphans. Mm -hmm. You know, he should be, mm -hmm. you know, because they have one area they can churn. Then you go, are you helping the one leg orphans? Oh, well, no, I don't really make that much money, but, you know, those people, those rich people, they should really be, it's like, well, how much are you giving? Well, I'm, you know, I don't have to make that much money. It's like, mm -hmm. well, you, you know, you could do something. You're not volunteering. It's like, you're complaining about something. You're not doing anything about it. This is not quite the same thing, but. Well, it's just, you know, it's almost the same now. Yeah, he created us to do something. Yeah. So let's see. So we talk about responses to unanswered prayer. How do we respond to unanswered prayer? So there's basically two responses to unanswered prayer. So one are acts of faith. So more praying or fasting or standing on a promise. So if we look in scripture and see that God has promised something, then we can stand on that promise and we want to pray that promise back to God. So those are some of the acts we can do. And the other option is we rest and wait. So 
there are some times where God will only give us something when we stop seeking after it. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, we'll take the credit for it ourselves. Yeah. Look what I found. Or, yeah, look what, look what, look what, what I, I got. Look what I, yeah. Because once you stop trying, if you get it, then you know that, okay, there's no way. Or if mm -hmm. you're in a situation where there's no way you could have done it, that's when God gets the glory. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you'll need, he'll need to put you in a situation where there's no way where you thought you could get yourself out. So it's like a lot of times we think we know the solution. So sometimes he has to put us in a place where, and then, so you, and then you get somewhere and you talk about, oh, you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Or, you know, look at, the, look at me and, you know, and I hate those people with the workout thing. Oh, if I could do it, anybody could do it. Or rich people, oh, if I could do it, anybody could do it. It's like nobody in the world is in a bad, as, in a bad situation as I was in. Mm -hmm. You know, if I could do it, that's what, that's what that's saying. Yeah. If I could do it, anybody could do it. It's saying there's nobody in the whole world in a worse situation than I was in, and I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> So it's like, if that uh, was true, there would be a lot of people like them, you know. Yeah, yeah, but they want to think They don't that, tell you the truth. They tell you I did this, but they don't tell you they're starving themselves, and, you know. Mm, or the workout. Yeah, yeah. To, eat, to eat what we want to eat. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but it's, but if you're, but if, but that means they weren't in a situation where they was so bad that they thought, okay, I, I couldn't have done it. Because it's like you mm -hmm. get to some point where you go, I can't, I can't do it. Yeah. So it's like, okay, God needed to put you in a place where you didn't think it, you could do it or mm -hmm. didn't think it could be done. And so then you'll know God did it. <laughs> yeah, one guy saying, if I could do it, anybody else can. There's another guy who went through the exact same thing and said, I couldn't do it. Yeah. But it still happened. Must have been God. Oh, yeah. 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 Exactly. So in conclusion, oh, go ahead. No, I'll just say two different mindsets. Yeah. Because, yeah. Well, one is, uh, yeah, you put your faith in God. Mm -hmm. you, you get recognition to God. The other one is you put your faith in yourself <laughs> and your ability. So see, in conclusion, so in the absence of answers or breakthrough, it's supposed to encourage us to try to find out why it didn't work. So when we don't get answers, it's supposed to encourage us to try to figure out why. Mm -hmm. Because if you got a problem, so it's, you got two options. You could either try to fix you or you could try to change God. Well, when you put it that way, <laughs> um. <laughs> so you can, you know, we want to seek to find out why, why, did, why we aren't getting the answers. Um, and so we can't create our own theology, though, to answer. That's the problem with the church is that people will ask somebody something and they're supposed to know, so they'll come up with an answer. You know, we can't create our own theology based on unanswered prayers. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, that's what God wanted. It's like, oh, that's not fair. It, you know, it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem, oh, well, that's just, that was God's plan. You know, we're, we're creating our own theology to rationalize unanswered prayers. Mm -hmm. It's like we don't have an answer, so we're just creating something that sounds good mm. to rationalize it. You know, we need to f try to search to find out why. You know, we can't just say it's God's timing. Um, it's supposed to make us question. It's supposed to make us unsatisfied. But it's not supposed to make us hopeless. So to keep seeking for the answer. And it's not good to make, though, your primary focus what God hasn't done for mm -hmm. you. <laughs> so if, like, your whole, all you're thinking about God is what he hasn't done for you, then that's not a healthy relationship. I mean, it's okay to go ahead with requests, but it's just like if you have a relationship with a person. Yeah. It's like all you think about is what they haven't done. They haven't massaged my feet today. They used <laughs> to do this. They, you know, if you're thinking more about what they didn't do than the good things they did do, then that's not a healthy relationship. 
And so our focus shouldn't be on what God didn't do. And normally we are selfish. We we see when people do us wrong or they don't appreciate something we do for them. But when um, when they do something good, we we just take it for granted. Yeah. You know. I deserve it. Yeah. You feel entitled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was entitled to that. Yeah. So if you have a, and also a concern is if you have an area in your life where you're not going to be happy unless you get this. It's like, mm -hmm. this is one thing that I want, and I'm not going to be happy unless I have this. Then that's an op a place where the enemy, that's just set up for the enemy to come in and, and get influence in your life if you don't get that thing. So you shouldn't have any one thing that, if I don't get this one thing, then I'm going to be unhappy. So we're worshiping something else. Yeah. Yeah. Wanting something else rather than wanting God, number one. Right, right. So, and then finally, um, it's okay to, you know, go ask God, you know, why situations happen. Or if you need to make a decision, ask God what you should think about a specific situation or a specific decision. So those are the ten reasons. Any thoughts? A couple of places where I was thinking, huh, well, when you put it that way, obviously, <laughs> like, you don't think about it. That, uh, I don't think I remember what they were anymore, but... Yeah, on well, number seven, one I, time was, I, said that, but. I was just... Uh, Assimilating all them. Mm. Number seven was the. Uh, oh no 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 seven eight. Eight yeah eight you gave control, control of the enemy. enemy yeah. Yeah that was a lot to put in a mm -hmm. little bit of time. Um, and that was probably new. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm pretty sure it was not. <laughs> And uh, maybe one, yeah, I may have a, a lesson on that. Well, I have always mm -hmm. uh, said that whatever has happened to me is because this is my fault, you know, because because I went and had, I got pregnant out of, without getting married, right? Mm. And so whatever, what happened to me is, it, it is my fault because God has given us, um, He has given us uh, the ability to know what's right and what's wrong. Even that being believers, we still know that's not right. Right. You know? Yeah. And, uh, um, so, but never went into very specific, like we went today, what we done, the, the three the three types of um, access. access, which is body, mm -hmm. mind, and soul. Yeah. You know, and, and I have heard that before, that people do with, like, with the Ouija. Board and stuff yeah, like Ouija that. board. Yeah, Ouija board. Yeah, I forgot I left that out. Yeah. But yeah, that's another one of the occult So type. they are... That's inviting yeah, the devil the enemy, to come yeah. in. Yeah. Very so that's... Yeah. Scary. Yeah, there are a lot of things to invite. So actually, so that segment... Oh, and, and, and drugs. You know, I, I talked yeah. to one of our brothers, and he yes. um, he was explaining how how when people that drug, right, they get into another level not just the alcohol and the smoking, but yeah. other types of drugs. How they get into a level where they see things. Yeah. And they and um, and so yeah, yeah, that's that's letting the enemy come in to you spiritually. You're seeing things, you know. You. Yeah. Was that a brother that used to be among us? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the drugs, the alcohol. I mean, they call it alcohol. They call it spirits. Mm -hmm. I mean, people. Yeah, they use it to see things. I mean, in it to try to get a spiritual type of. I mean, the Ouija boards, you know, it's a spiritual type of of the thing, and uh, horoscopes is a spiritual type of thing. It's just the wrong spirits. Yes, it is. It's just the wrong spirits, and once you start messing with them, you're giving them access to to come in I mean, because they they need permission. 
to control our lives. You know, we, we go to the horse. To so control your lives directly. And I mean, you can, I mean, they can, obviously, they can act through another person mm -hmm. and influence you. They don't need permission to do that. Mm -hmm. But to, to influence your will, they need permission. Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, they can, you know, they can have somebody else come and beat you up, you know, that without you doing anything, without you doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. But... But to have them influence in you, influencing your will, you have to give them access. Yeah, so that, that segment, you gave control of the enemy, mm -hmm. is kind of kin to the fighting with power discussion about the tactics of the enemy. Mm -hmm. so, so that this could be, that's how you get uh, you may move outside God's will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is, yeah, you're moving outside of God's will. Because God, you know, they're, they're the things that, you know, the obvious things, you know, the, the sexual, the abortion, you know, those are obvious. But then when God says, you know, if you don't forgive others, then I won't forgive you. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, God, you know, and do not judge yet. You, I mean, he's telling mm -hmm. you don't do this. But... He's not necessarily getting into details about what the consequences are. Mm -hmm. So all the things that God that in the Bible says don't do, it's not necessarily telling you explicitly what the negative consequences are. But it's but it's there for a reason. He's telling you not to do it for a reason. And yeah, but we fight our battle isn't against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of the instructions he gave us is yeah, that's for reasons. That we and on night, our our answer is on Matthew ten one, right? Say it again. On on the ninth, God already answered you. Oh, the ninth. Yeah. The next meeting. No, no, not the nine. Um, the oh, number nine. nine. Recent, yeah. Oh yeah, the number nine was um. Yeah, God already answered mm -hmm. you. Yes. Yes, and so yeah, I had another piece in there with uh, the God already answered you, but I didn't want to have that and the uh, the part about the enemy and mm. all that. It would have been like a whole lot of a whole lot of new stuff at once. But yeah, so the next time it's going to be talking about faith, but it's going to get into more detail about. God already answering you and and the powers He's already given us. Mm -hmm. so it's be... I, I um, like how you explain how in Genesis one, mm -hmm. one two, how um, God created this beautiful world out of chaos. Out of, right. Yeah. And He chose to create the chaos mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. He said, "Hmm, let me see. How can I make a beautiful world? I know." I create chaos and void and darkness. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. not sure if I would have started you, with that. <laughs> are you sure about? Well, I guess you were. Oh, okay. See, it worked work out. out right? yeah, yeah, it worked and out. And in a lot of Up areas until, of the Bible, uh, the Apple thing. Yeah, well, of course, mm -hmm. no, no in Apple a lot of all. areas of the Bible, he talks about um, building something. You know, mm. like the clay, right? But when you He's building something with the clay, you know, making a nice mm, pot piece of potter. Ornament. Yeah, yeah the uh -huh. potter. You know, another area where it's a lot of dirt. Mm -hmm. He forms it. And so he, he forms. He does beautiful out of from dust. ashes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful ashes. So form the man. He's out of forming the dust. a man. So so forming. He formed Adam. Mm -hmm. Out of but he creates out of chaos. Mm -hmm. So he forms, his form is something from something. But when you do something from nothing, so when you're starting something new, something brand new, mm -hmm. comes out of chaos sometimes. So if you're building on something that exists, you're forming. But 
if you're building something brand new, sometimes you need chaos, mm -hmm. like a flood. Or a giant pile of Legos. Yes. Pretty chaotic. <laughs> you build something. I mean, not that it uses Legos, but you know. Yeah. And, Building us. It's building us. Alright. Alright. So let's walk in the way. Let's seek the truth and let's be the light to a lost and dying world. Good night. Yeah. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Right. And so, then it right. Is that quoting him? That's Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28. So it says, we know that God things uses all things for good for those who are according to his purpose. So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of for those That's, who. Yeah. So it's not everybody. But, but then again, it's but even. Saying, but it's even that all things it says it doesn't say right. all things are good. Right. It right. Says right. It uses all things. Uses all things, good. including the evil. Including it's like, evil. That's kind of mind blowing, that. but yeah, that's why we'll he's talk got a little I bit about that. Did you? Okay. No, I said we will. Oh, we will. We will talk a little bit, but um, yeah. I mean, he. Yeah, I mean, Satan has a purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, but. But it, but I mean, it's not even just Satan, though. We can do evil things, yeah. and he can use it for good. But it doesn't mean all things are good. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's... For the, but for those, if you, but if you've completely walked away from him and turned him away, then it doesn't. It's it's not necessarily talking about you. No, it's not good for you. He won't work things <laughs> out good for you. <laughs>